So let's postpone just for a little bit um, the explicit definition of what exactly what these tree ordinals are. Um, again, I've, I've given the basic idea. They are ordinary ordinals with fundamental sequences attached. Um, and we're going to define an extension of the fast growing hierarchy. I'm going to use the letter uh, lowercase v. It's not the Veblen function, so sorry about the, again, notational collision. There's going to be a phi function for every level n of the hierarchy. So again, natural numbers, countable ordinals, uncountable, even more uncountable ordinals. Um, and each one is going to use, this is a crucial thing, it's going to use an ordinal from one level higher to control basically the recursion and diagonalization of a function from a certain level to itself. So let's see how that works. So for each natural number n, we're going to have a phi sub n function that takes two inputs and produces one output. It's got an omega n plus one input, and that's kind of the, the control input. And then an omega n, and that's what we want to think of as the actual ordinal that we're operating on. And it's going to create another omega n size ordinal. And so this is how it's going to be denoted. Phi sub n of, say, gamma delta is going to go back and live in omega n. Okay, so it starts out um, by a really important thing is that phi sub 0 um, is exactly going to be the fast growing hierarchy. So this is what I mean by saying it's really an extension of the fast growing hierarchy. Straight up, it's an extension. Um, at the zero level, it is nothing more nor less. And so this is the kind of, kind of thing we're used to. Uh, the alpha, an ordinal argument, is the subscript for f, and that controls which f we're talking about. It controls exactly the pattern of recursion, iteration, diagonalization, etc. And then we apply it to just a plain old number, x. So this is this fits the pattern that phi sub zero should have as control argument something in omega 1, countable ordinal, as we're used to for f, um, and the other input is simply a, an ordinary natural number. Okay, so that's, this is one thing that, to remember is that phi sub 0 is just exactly the fgh in a different notation. Okay, now what's the definition of the fast growing hierarchy? Well, there's three parts to it, um, and I'm just going to restate that in the phi sub 0 notation, and then that'll give us a hint for what the the generalized version should be. Okay, so phi sub zero, that's just f, uh, sorry, phi sub zero with zero as the control input, that should just be the f sub zero function, that's good old successor, that's what everything here is based on, just good old successor. Applying that many, 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 many times. Okay, now what happens when you have a successor ordinal in the control slot? Well, you apply the previous ordinal version, you apply phi sub zero with the previous ordinal alpha in the control slot, iterated, let's say x times. I'm using x even though I kind of don't like using that for a natural number input, partly because I'm agreeing with Wainer's article and also because we run out of good middle of the alphabet letters that feel more like uh, integers. Anyway, um, this is um, the, the um, the iteration step that's standard in the fast growing hierarchy. We put x into the input, but we do the previous function that many times. Um, so that's the iteration, the multiple iteration idea. And then there's the diagonalization, of course, when alpha is a limit ordinal. Ooh, I should put that in here. If alpha is a limit ordinal, um, we just apply phi naught applied to alpha of x, whatever was leading up to it. Um, with that, with that as the control function, apply to x. So really, this is exactly the fast growing hierarchy in a new notation. Okay, um, so we're going to just straight up generalize these three, and then we're just going to have to add one more eventually to make it a complete definition for the higher number classes. Okay, um, so here's the here's one thing that we're that I want to talk about in, in more and more stages of precision as we go. Um, a fundamental sequence. We're used to the idea of a fundamental sequence as like an honest to God sequence. Something in omega one is a countable ordinal, and the way you sneak up on those, and the way we've we've used those ordinals to define fast growing functions, is to have an ordinary sequence indexed by the natural numbers whose limit is the ordinal we're talking about. Okay, but now what we have is that if you have an an ordinal in one of the higher number classes, one of these uncountable guys, most of those don't have countable sequences leading up to them. There's a few that do. Those are the ones of, quote, countable cofinality that I talked about a little bit um, in previous videos, but most of them don't. And in fact, for example, like omega one, little omega one, uh, that doesn't have any countable sequence approaching it. That's the most one of the most famous things about the least uncountable ordinal is you can't get to it 
by counting. Um, it's a very, very important thing about it. So what we, uh, the generalized notion of what we could call a fundamental sequence in quotes for one of these bigger ordinals is a family of smaller ordinals, but not indexed by the natural numbers, which we're now calling omega zero, but indexed by some bigger omega k. Now k is still less than n, okay? Um, ooh, actually, let's see. Actually, less than n plus one. Okay, so if we're going to sneak up on some ordinal in, say, omega-2, we can sneak up on that by a family indexed by omega-1. So let me give you the, the absolute simplest example. It might be a little too simple, but um, here's a very simple example. Little omega-1, that is the simplest interesting element of big omega-2. And I know the notation seems a little weird with the numbers, but it works out very well. That is actually just in disguise. It's just the identity function. The fundamental sequence for that is the identity function on omega omega one. So what we, what we have is this this new ordinal, little omega one. It's living in this new number class, big omega two. And the way we sneak up on it is we basically, and here I say that here, we basically just quote list every single countable ordinal in order. Um, that is not a list in our usual sense of list because it's not countable. But it's okay. It's still a perfectly well-defined function from big omega one to itself. Um, and we'll come back to, to that. It's actually the, the key thing about defining these, these tree ordinal gadgets. Okay. Um, we're going to need to use that as soon as we get to big, um, big ordinal classes, getting above like the omega zero, omega one stuff, because um, diagonalization won't work in all those cases, and we're going to need to be, be um, we're going to need to to work on that. Okay, so here's uh, the full official definition, but it's there's going to be some part of it that I will immediately say, huh? What the heck does that mean? Okay, so here's phi the the phi function definition. It is supposed to be something that basically takes an omega n type of number and creates another omega n type of number, but uses as a control a bigger type of number, one one more, one up in the hierarchy, okay? And phi sub n, again, of zero with the control being zero, the very simplest phi sub n function with the control variable set to zero is just successor. When the control variable has been incremented by one, it's a successor, you just figure out, you assume you previously, previously have understood what the previous function looks like, and so this dot means this turn that turns this into a function with the dot being the open slot. So this phi n of alpha dot is the function that takes, say, gamma to phi n of alpha gamma gamma. Very standard kind of thing for um, putting an open slot into a function. So we look at that function, that's the previous version of the phi n, and we iterate it beta times on beta itself. So notice how that's exactly straight up generalization of what we were doing before, although we're going to, you might notice already there's something a little suspicious about that. Okay. Um, let me just skip down to the last one here. This is exactly what we had before. Okay. So now we're going to have, suppose alpha, that's our control variable, that's something in omega n plus one. It could be a limit, um, a limit ordinal with a fundamental quote sequence indexed by the next lower kind of number class. These are going to be the most powerful kinds of alphas. And the cool thing about that is if those guys, that has a fundamental sequence indexed by omega sub n, well then it's going to be, those fundamental sequence elements are going to be things like of the form alpha of beta, where beta is in omega n. Oh wait, but there's beta in omega n already. That's the input. And so we can diagonalize. We can not only put beta here, we can put beta in the um, in the fundamental sequence index slot. Okay, and we don't really need that. Okay. Um, so notice this is exactly the, the generalization of the diagonalization rule we had before. Let's go up back up to that. For the usual thing where we have a number here, an ordinary natural number, and a limit ordinal alpha, if we understand, if we know what the correct fundamental sequence is that we're using for alpha, it totally made sense to put in that x as the argument of the fundamental sequence and as the input here. And that's what has to be more interesting in this case, that now 
we're defining a way to, create, to take omega n numbers, these bigger things like countable ordinals, even uncountable ordinals, create new bigger ones. So this beta is living in omega n. So it totally makes sense that the alphas, the limit ordinals alpha, might have uh, fundamental quote sequences that are indexed by these more complicated families of numbers. In particular, it could be omega n. Okay, well, what if it isn't though? Um, it turns out that it's it's important that you allow limit ordinals that are a little more little less powerful. They might have fundamental sequences indexed by omega k, like for example, just good old natural numbers, where k is not as big as it could be, not almost up to n plus one, and not not even as big as n. Well, turns out that there's a very there's a very simple trick there. It's our absolutely standard trick. It's we want to create. Oops, sorry. We want to create the output phi sub n of alpha beta. That is going to be a um, an omega n type of ordinal, something of the omega n size. Okay, let's just create it by creating explicitly its fundamental sequence, and say, okay, what is that evaluated at index gamma? And we just plug that in to the alpha slot. So we say, and so we this is a very common thing we've done. We sneak up on an alpha with um, by limits. Notice that we kind of could do that here, but we really, really don't want to because this is where a lot of the important fast-growing action happens. This, this, this is the diagonalization trick. Okay, so this is the idea. We're basing everything on successor, just like we did in everything, especially fast-growing hierarchy, especially. Okay, we iterate exactly when we always have. When alpha is a successor ordinal, just like with the fast-growing hierarchy, we just iterate the previous case. Um, we diagonalize when it makes sense. That's when we can put the beta that we already are putting in as the ordinary input of the function, we put that into the fundamental sequence index of alpha. And uh, we just pass the fundamental sequence through phi sub n, that's this third line, when it doesn't make sense to, to diagonalize. Pretty abstract, lots to digest, but that's why I'm gonna do a bunch of examples of this, this thing, okay? Um, but one really important thing to realize is it is as purely simple a generalization of the fast growing hierarchy to bigger kinds of ordinals as I can as I've ever seen. Okay. So let's see if we have time. Yeah, I might have time for um oh yeah, we need to explain one more thing before we go to examples. Um what the heck does this mean? This is just a function. This is phi sub n of alpha blank with that blank so the open slot. It's a function of one variable that takes an omega n type of number and spits out another one. What the heck does that mean to iterate it beta times when beta is not just a finite natural number? We know what it means then. Just, just really just do this seven times or 12 times or whatever, just as a function composition. What the heck does it mean when beta is not finite? Okay, so we need to actually explain a little bit about what transfinite iteration would mean. Okay, so that's what this is talking about. Okay, well, we're going to do something that looks sort of similar to the definition of phi sub n. It's totally general. It's just really how you define transfinite iteration in this, in anything like this context. Okay, so I'm just going to have some random function. I'm going to call it psi because that's what uh, Wainer calls it. Um, and um, it's not not intended to be related to like the the ordinal collapsing function psi. It's just a random function from, and it's going to be from omega n to omega n. So takes a one of these interesting kinds of numbers, ordinal tree ordinal numbers. You just want to think of it as an ordinal right now, um, and produces the same kind of ordinal. And okay, and I'm going to have some beta that's also exactly an ordinal at the same level, same kind of number. Okay, and we define iteration by th three rules. We do it inductively or recursively, whatever you want to say, and that is the zeroth uh, iterate of any function just is the identity. Doesn't do anything. Okay, very standard. Um, if beta plus one, if this is a successor ordinal, well, we know how to deal with that. Assuming you've figured out how to iterate psi beta times on some argument delta, you just do psi one more time. Okay, and so those two rules would totally take care of you if beta is any finite number, and it just replicates the idea that like psi to the seventh power just means do psi compose it with itself seven times. And then all we have to do is do the same trick we just did, which is passing limits through. Suppose that beta is a limit ordinal with a particular choice of fundamental sequence, which is always what we have in this world. 
um, to apply that to delta, to, to iterate psi beta times and apply it to delta, well, I just have to tell you what a fundamental sequence for that answer is. And what you do is you just plug that in and you say, okay, don't iterate it all beta times. Don't go all the way to beta. Just do whatever beta of gamma is. Okay. Now, beta of gamma itself might well be a limit ordinal. In that case, you're going to have to use this definition again and again and again and again, but eventually you're going to get back down to the successor case and um, something that's a little bit more, more ordinary. Okay. So it's just ordinary iteration, and when necessary, we pass to fundamental sequences, which we've done before. Okay. Um, okay. So I, I don't think I'll have time to do examples in this video. I'll do them in the next one. Okay. Um, but just, just a reminder and a, kind of a hint, this is giving us a lot of information about what the careful definition of tree ordinals is going to have to be. Um, in the definition of phi sub n, and even in this just definition of this very general idea of transfinite iteration, transfinite iteration the, the fundamental sequence, or you know, sequence in quotes, um, that's attached to an ordinal is totally used every single time in all of these definitions. It's not remotely a subsidiary thing. And so those generalized fundamental sequences are going to become really absolutely part of the definition of the data of the tree ordinal. They, they really are going to be the definition, as it turns out, of the tree ordinal. OK, um, next video, we will do some examples of what I uh, probably is, is looking fairly abstract and complicated with phi right now. But we'll see that it, it's not too bad.